Hello everyone and welcome back to another video with Scruffy Tales. And in today's video we will be talking about air superiority in Ukraine and the issues uh, surrounding that. And also why Ukraine will more than likely have some problems in bombing the Russian front line. So let's start off with establishing what air superiority is or air supremacy. Uh, since people like to talk about uh, these terms when uh, ever the uh, topic of F-16 or Gripen comes up in, uh, in reference to Ukraine. Uh, there are several stages to uh, air superiority, uh, air supremacy being the uh, highest form of air superiority. You completely dominate the airspace, uh, airspace. and right below air supremacy you have air superiority. And then there you have a couple of other levels below that as well. But with air superiority, you uh, begin to... Uh, establish dominance over the enemy and then with air supremacy there's literally nothing you can do about it and basically it comes down to uh, two points uh, reducing an enemy's ability or denying the enemy to operate in the skies to either strike at or conduct reconnaissance against friendly forces combined with the ability to conduct air operations against the enemy without a high risk of failure or loss of life and equipment. Uh, this basically sums up air superiority and air supremacy. So, <clears throat> with that in mind, let's take a look at the Russian Air Force in 2023 and some estimated numbers. Uh, what I found is that the Russian Air Force is has an estimated number of around 3,000 or around a total of 3,652 aircraft of various sorts estimated uh, of which around 900 are fighter jets another 200 are close air support uh, jets and then you have 540 gunships So looking at those numbers and compare that to the Russian losses in Ukraine that are to date uh, estimated to be around 315 planes and 316 helicopters. So looking at numbers alone, Russia should clearly dominate the skies of Ukraine. Yet Russia does not enjoy air superiority. And that is because Russia cannot properly deal with Ukrainian air defenses. The Russian Air Force has a minimal effect, therefore, on the front line. And in reality, it is only their most advanced gunships, um, attack helicopters, that are armed with their best and most advanced anti-tank missiles, that are a real threat and have a real impact on the war. But the problem is that they are, you know, slowly running out of these as well, because uh, Ukrainian uh, surface to air missiles are, you know, day by day taking them out one by one. And uh, as it happens, the Swedish made RBS 70 surface, surface to air missile is according to reports very good uh, at dealing with russian helicopters and have taken out quite a lot of these dangerous gunships so can the ukrainian air force achieve dominance well, we saw the numbers that russia has at their disposal and the amount of aircraft they've lost trying to uh, invade and uh, conquer Ukraine. So what can 
Ukraine do with 40 or 50 F-16s in this case? Can they achieve air superiority? No, no, they can't. It's, uh, it's impossible. Could they be used to support the ground forces? You know, potentially. Uh, an F-16 or Gripen uh, could launch a full host of bombs and missiles at ground targets that would help the Ukrainian ground troops in uh, reaching Russian positions and uh, overrunning them. But that would not be without great risk to the Ukrainian pilots because of uh, Russian surface-to-air missiles. And then the question becomes, is it worth the risk uh, sending in these few aircraft uh, only to lose them without potentially any real gains on the battlefield. Uh, because you only have 40 or 50 of these planes and 40 or 50 pilots, and these pilots are, they're, they're not only specifically trained to be fighter pilots, they are taken, they are the creme de la creme of the Ukrainian Air Force, and they are then specifically trained on these foreign fighters, and some of them are even being schooled in English to uh, be able to fly these fighters. So this is a very elite unit within the Ukrainian Air Force. And do you want to risk these pilots, these ver very valuable pilots in moving into range of Russian surface air missiles? I don't know. I, I, I'm skeptical, to be honest. And as an example, if we go back to the Gulf War, uh, the U.S. actually held back their uh, famous A-10 close, uh, close air support aircraft uh, because it was too dangerous to fly CAS missions. Initially, they went in and uh, attacked Iraqi targets with the, uh, the big uh, rotating uh, autocannon and with other weapons, but they were taking too much fire. They were taking it, the risk to the aircraft was too great, and therefore the risk of losing pilots was too great. So they decided to drop uh, CAS missions and instead swap the launching missiles from far away where it was safe. So the CAS aircraft was pulled off duty from doing cast runs and instead started launching missiles because the risks were too great to the pilots flying in that close to the enemy. And using that as reference, if Ukraine has so few pilots and so few fighter, fighters, will Ukraine really move them into range of a full host tons of Russian surface-to-air missiles and risk losing them quickly, I should add, uh, with minimal gains on the battlefield. I don't know. I, I, think, I think they're too valuable and I don't think they will be risking the lives of these uh, pilots in these kinds of missions. Now, initially, I don't think Ukraine will be able to achieve air superiority with these Western aircraft at all, or even be used to be uh, to support the ground troops. I mean, as time progresses, then yes, sure, maybe we can reach a point where Ukraine starts attacking ground targets once um, it's safe to operate in the air. But that I think that might be uh, quite some time away in the future, to be honest. So what can the F-16s and potentially Gripen and even French fighters achieve? Well, Russian surface-to-air missiles will undoubtedly force the Ukrainian Air Force to operate far away from the front line. And therefore it is more than likely, I think, that Western fighters, American, French, and Swedish, 
uh, will be used to uh, attack incoming cruise missiles that are aimed at civilian targets. So they will launch from safe uh, places in the west of Ukraine as soon as Russian missiles pop up on the radar and then engage them with air-to-air -air missiles in, uh, in hopes of uh, taking them out before they reach uh, the cities and uh, civilian targets. Uh, so they will be used defensively to uh, reduce civilian casualties. Offensively, uh, they will probably be used as platforms to launch uh, cruise missiles like the Storm Shadow and Taurus. So they will take off from airfields, get up into the air and launch, I don't know, how many? Two? Four? Each? Uh, at targets in uh, occupied territory then head back down to ground and uh, uh, refuel, possibly rearm. And in order for these fighters to be able to support the ground troops, first of all, Russian air defenses have to be properly reduced and dealt with. And sure, this can be achieved with the radar seeking missiles. You move up with an, uh, with an F-16, and you wait for the uh, Russian missiles uh, to lock onto you with the raid with their radar and stuff like that. And then you can use a missile that tracks that radar, launch your own missile, take it out. And without radar, the missile can't uh, be effective. This obviously has one drawback, and this means that you have to put your own aircraft and your own pilot at risk and in range of the enemy surface to air missile. And if you only have 40 or 50 pilots and fighters, the question is if you want to risk losing them, going out hunting for SAM sites and potentially getting shot by man pads and other vehicles and what have you. But, but let's say they managed this eventually. They managed to take out Russian uh, surface-to-air missiles. Uh, the uh, airspace is clear enough for uh, Ukrainian fighters to operate and attack the Russian front line. I mean, what would Russia do then? What would the Russian response be? Well, probably Russia would send in its air force in over Ukraine. Uh, Russia would lose planes and pilots uh, to Russian, uh, to Ukrainian uh, air defenses, obviously, and to uh, Ukrainian uh, fighters with uh, more advanced missiles and radar systems. But again, numbers are important. Ukraine does not have the numbers to go up against the amount of fighters that Russia has available. So even if Ukraine has more advanced missiles, more advanced fighters, they will start lo losing planes and pilots eventually. And every sh fighter and pilot lost is felt tremendously more for Ukraine than compared to uh, 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 Russia, right? So Ukraine could uh, potentially win uh, the air war uh, against even against uh, Russian superior numbers relying solely on better planes and better missiles yes but they will lose I think so many aircraft and so many pilots that they won't be able to enjoy uh, the uh, victory because they won't have enough aircraft left to uh, exploit the fact that they have taken out the Russian Air Force, if you get what I mean. So, yeah, it's... You, the Ukraine Air Force, they have a real pr problem dealing with the uh, air defenses. And once they have dealt with that, they will have a real problem dealing with the Russian Air Force itself. So let's illustrate the problem here. Uh, the best Russian surface-to-air missiles have a range of up to 400 kilometers. And if you place these systems inside of Russia, 
uh, as well as in occupied territories, Russia covers half of Ukraine's airspace. And this will force Ukraine to set up their airfields far away from the front line, uh, not only to avoid these SAM sites, but also to be able to detect and engage Russian cruise missiles aimed at these airfields as these missiles are launched inside Russia coming in towards the airfields. So with 40 or 50 F-16s, a couple of Gripens maybe, and even some French aircraft, Ukraine will have a hard time operating close to the front line in order to support the ground troops because as soon as they get you know remotely near or further away from than that even you know russia will start launching missiles towards them uh, so it will be uh, really problematic for ukrainian fighters reaching the front line Uh, but, well, say that the uh, Russian SAMs are actually dealt with and Western fighters can then move in close to actually support the ground troops. You have uh, uh, Western uh, bombs that are uh, uh, glide bombs, essentially. You have like the small diameter bomb, uh, for instance, and JDAMs where you actually take a classic bomb that you just drop down. You, attach wings to it and make it into a glider uh, exactly like the small diameter bomb which increases the range dramatically obviously and in and in terms of the small diameter bomb they have their reach is greater than the reach of the uh, range of um, russian air-to-air -air missiles launched by their fighters uh, so this means that an F-16 could get in close enough to drop small diameter bombs towards targets along the front line and still be uh, out of range of Russian fighters. And this forces Russian fighters, uh, in this case, to move in and over uh, Ukrainian controlled territory in order to be able to engage an F-16. And this obviously puts the Russian fighter and the pilot at great risk and increasing the chances for uh, Ukraine to be able to shoot them down before the, the Russian fighters can actually engage uh, Ukrainian F-16s. Um, but despite the dangers, I think that Russia would probably, probably still be flying these missions because they can't just let Ukraine use their handful of Western fighters to drop bombs all day long on the front line. They have no choice but to go after them and risk their very expensive aircraft and their very va valuable pilots in order to reduce the numbers of uh, Ukrainian fighters. So the Russian Air Force would still, despite the high risk, fly in over Ukrainian airspace and get shot down en masse trying to hunt down F-16s. However, Russian surface-to-air missiles positioned inside of Russia where Ukraine cannot strike them relying on Western weapons will still be able to track and engage Ukrainian fighters long before they can support any ground troops. So even if they clear out all the SAMs inside of Ukraine, Ukrainian pilots are still more than likely gonna be targeted and uh, attacked by Russian SAMs located inside of Russia proper. And because of this, it is more than likely that the West cannot and will not provide enough aircraft to Ukraine so to have a proper effect on the front line because if Ukraine gets anywhere near the front line, the skies will be filled with Russian missiles coming after them. Ukraine has one hope though, and that is what we've learned from the recent strikes against Crimea. 
Ukraine has successfully launched strikes against the Russian Black Sea Fleet in and around Sevastopol, uh, striking at ships at sea, hitting vessels in dry dock, and even striking uh, buildings used by fleet command, killing high-ranking officers, admirals, and what have you, taking out high-priority ships, warships, uh, lo located in harbor and in dock and what have you. And uh, Jesus Christ, my phone. And Ukraine's hope is that this could potentially be an indication that Russian air defenses are not as extensive or as reliable as they should be. Because if you can kill high-ranking admirals at a fleet's HQ headquarters, if you can take that out with cruise missiles, then the Russians obviously have issues because that location should be you, you shouldn't be able to reach it by land, sea, or air at all. Yet Ukraine managed that. They managed to launch successful strikes at the Black Sea Fleet headquarters. And if this is true that Russian air defenses have significant issues, this could potentially open up venues of attack for Ukrainian fighter jets that will allow them to move in close enough to launch attacks all along the Russian front line. I'm sure you've come across comments online uh, that make the case that NATO help is basically useless in this war because NATO relies too heavily on air superiority. And without air superiority, their advice is useless because anything NATO does, anything NATO uh, suggests to Ukraine involves having 100 aircraft in uh, above your head bombing the shit out of the enemy. The fact is that Ukraine cannot establish air superiority, and obviously NATO knows this. And the advice, uh, tactics, and training offered by NATO is in no way reliant on air superiority, because the fundamentals of how an army operates does not involve the air force on any level. Logistics, army logistics, have to be able to function without aircraft. Tanks must be able to attack the enemy without aircraft. Infantry must be able to maneuver, to uh, operate, to do tactical uh, decisions and all of that without having aircraft overhead. An army does not need the air force to function. Now, is the air force useful for combined arms uh, engagements? Obviously it is. Uh, air land battle doctrine and all of that. Yes, you need the Air Force and the Army to uh, achieve more than they could have uh, achieved on their own. Yes, but you don't need air power to make an army functional, right? Hell, Afghanistan should have taught us that, right? Uh, ordinary farmers with Kalashnikovs managed to successfully fight a war for 20 years without any form of artillery or air support. So yes, you can have an army that functions without air power. And NATO armies, they, they know this, they, they know how to operate without air power. I mean, when you train infantry, it's not like you train them to take a hill and then call in uh, airstrikes. They take, you train them to take a hill and rely on the rifles and machine guns that they bring with them to hold the hill, right? Uh, it's NATO armies know knows how to maneuver, how to operate, and how to function without having air power around 24/7. So people who claim that NATO cannot fight without air superiority, they don't know what they're talking about. It, it, that's the end of it. They don't know what they're talking about.
And the reason why Ukraine's offensive is moving so slowly is it's because of the extensive minefields, not because of lack of air support. It's because of these massive minefields all over the place. I mean, even if Ukraine had air superiority, these minefields would still be a major problem because they deny Ukraine the ability to maneuver. They deny them the, the ability to redeploy and to adjust to the front to the situation on the front line. And this would not have changed even if they had air superiority. But fact remains that even if air superiority is obviously valuable and extremely useful, this is something that Ukraine probably will not be able to achieve. And it's not something that Western countries can provide because Ukraine will need hundreds of aircraft to establish air superiority. And that's not available. Ukraine will not have that. So NATO will not provide them, you know, with suggestions on how to wage this war if they only had air superiority that's just nonsense nato will provide them some suggestions based on the equipment that ukraine has and sure nato may not have fought this kind of war before but that does not mean that the knowledge that nato provides is real is uh, irrelevant because you know uh, NATO has, what, 70 years of uh, knowledge, tactics, training, and know-how how to conduct war. And none of that is irrelevant. Because NATO troops, they know how to clear out the trench line and a building effectively. NATO troops knows how to engage enemy armor effectively. And NATO knows how to keep an army operational effectively. And isn't that what Ukraine needs? They need to know how to clear out a trench line. They need to know how to effectively clear out the building. They need to know how you effectively uh, organize logistics to keep an army operational. And NATO are experts at all of these things. And they are experts at maneuver warfare. Once Ukraine gets through and past the trenches and gets past all the uh, fortified buildings. So how then is NATO uh, NATO uh, help useless? How is NATO advice irrelevant? How is NATO training pointless when? NATO knows all of the things that Ukraine needs to know and when NATO provides Ukraine with all of these things. I, I don't understand the argument made by people that what NATO provides is irrelevant. Now the, ma the main issue that I, as far as I understand it, uh, is uh, how to punch through the minefields. This is where Ukraine and NATO have clashed on how to best achieve this and Ukraine has obviously chosen a more cautious approach uh, moving in with uh, smaller units to try and find a good spot to breach uh, while NATO as far as I can tell have uh, argued for pushed for a more powerful and uh, costly in terms of lives uh, all-out assault uh, with less focus on Bakhmut and moving troops down to the south and just move in and forcefully with lots of casualties involved punch through the russian defenses so that you get through and can then start the maneuver warfare behind the enemy line and uh, roll them uh, and surround them and uh, begin to uh, hunt them down on the vast open plains where there are no minefields And all of this uh, is entirely centered on how to best 
and the most effectively get through the Russian minefields that prevent proper maneuvering and prevent any redeployment at speed. So that is the problem here. It's not air superiority that is the problem that is making the Russian uh, Ukrainian offensive going as slow as it is. It is the Russian minefields. The mines are slowing down the Ukrainians, not the lack of air support. And air superiority is that's not something Ukraine can hope for. Well, they can hope for it, like I pointed out earlier, but more than likely they won't achieve it. So that is the hand they've been dealt, and that is what NATO is working with together with Ukraine. How do you achieve a breakthrough without any air support, any air superiority? And that is the argument between NATO and Ukraine. How do we do this without aircraft? And uh, Ukraine wants to make, move slow with leaders, as few casualties as possible, while uh, NATO wants to wants Ukraine to commit fully and make a big push breach and get through and start maneuvering behind the Russian lines as early as possible. So the mines are the major issue, not air superiority, because air superiority is not uh, within reach and has not been within reach for, uh, for Ukraine uh, at any point during this war. And the West has never been able to provide it without getting involved themselves, that is. That's all I have for you today, or at least in this video. Uh, thank you for listening, thank you for watching, and I hope I made some sense and uh, that I might have brought up a couple of uh, good pointers. And uh, if you disagree with anything, please uh, let me know in a comment. Uh, if I got something wrong, likewise, just share it down below in the comment section. I don't mind it if discussion is fun. And uh, if I mess something up, obviously, I should be corrected. So, yes, go ahead and write something down below in the comments. And, uh, yeah, with all that said, thank you, and I'll see you in the next one. Go Pomarsh, Ukraine!